Isabel. Hello. How do, you pronounce, how do you pronounce your last name? Muschamp or Mushamp. Correct. Uh, okay. Muschamp or what was the second one? Mushamp. Either one. Mushamp. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> Which is the correct pronunciation? It's Mushamp, but please know Mushamp. that I am not picky at all. Okay. I go with the all right. No problem. Um, can you see the interview? Can you see my screen? You see the interview questions? You know what? I can, um, I don't know why my, my screen won't flip. I guess I'll, I'll, I'll flip it over when I do my presentation. Okay. <laughs> All right. I, um, I do want to let you know I'm using my iPhone. Okay. No problem. Okay. I, okay. Can you see the interview question? Yes. No, yes. Oh. Okay, so we're going to give you, uh, you know, it's 127 right now. So we'll give you to about 130 to, re to review the questions so you at least have a chance to get them in your mind before we start the official process. Thank you. You're welcome. And then I'm supposed to also ask you for your ID. Do you have your driver's license that you could hold up to the to the screen just of, so that I? Can of course I. It? Of course I do. <laughs> of course I do. Just give me one moment, okay? Okay. No problem. Thank you for being patient with me. No problem. Vice versa. <laughs> <laughs> so sweet to me. Okay. I yeah. is closer? Yeah, please, please. Okay, I see it. All right, thank you. Of course. That's good, thank you. Excellent. <sighs> I love all these questions. You guys really care about the industry and about these kids. I'm so grateful that you guys have like, you guys have a hope for this pro. You guys have hope for this program. A lot of a lot of colleges don't see the potential. I'm so grateful you guys do. <sighs> That's incredible. Okay, it's it's one thirty. We're gonna go ahead and and get started. And Excellent. This is kind of the spiel that I go through for every single candidate, so that we make sure that we're fair. Uh, as we do the interview process, all right? So we welcome you to the Zoom interview. I've already seen your identification. We're gonna go ahead and introduce ourselves. My name is Dr. Maria Clinton. I am the interim CTE Dean that oversees the automotive program. Rosario. Um, I'm Rosario Gonzalez. I'm the full-time automotive instructor. Joe. There went Joe. I'm Joseph Owens, I'm the department chair for uh, technical trades, um, air condition, excuse me, air conditioning instructor. Your camera, your camera went off, Joe. Did it? Yes. Jack? Yes, uh, I am Jack Halliday. I uh, 
I'm a professor of the Hair Freeman Power Plant Program at Fox Field in the Hair Oil Program. I'm Rebecca. I'm the Senate Representative. My name is Rebecca Miller, and I teach biology. And Anna, I don't know if you want to introduce yourself or not. Good afternoon. I'm Anna Patton. I'm the HR recruiter, Human Resources. Okay, all right. So I um, want to inform all candidates that you are interviewing today for the full-time automotive instructor position. We've scheduled 60 minutes for your interview. There are a total of 13 questions, well, which will include an opportunity for you to ask questions at the end of the interview and a 15 minute presentation. We ask that you please stay on track, monitor your responses and time accordingly. At the end of the interview, you will interview with the president of Antelope Valley College via a Zoom uh, for an additional 15 minutes. Okay, we have prepared questions. We will be asking all candidates during their interviews today. Please take your time, relax, and provide the best response you can to the questions. There may be some committee members here you know today. Please explain all your answers as if you have not met anyone here before. Answer all questions briefly and in detail. Do not expect that we know your background. Committee members will be jotting down notes as you come on to the questions. Do not let this distract you. This is our way of ensuring that we document your responses to recall later during our discussions. Okay? And with that, we're going to start, and I get to start off. Maria, I'm yes? sorry to interrupt. Can we please wait until Jim Owen gets back on the screen? Oh, I thought he came back on. Not yet. Thank you. Do not know what's happened to this camera. Um, you got. You can move the camera from the screen, Joe. There you go. Keep moving it. While oh, you're using that camera, okay. There's two cameras. There's that one. Zoom in. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Okay. Are we okay? I think so. Are we okay, Anna, to proceed? Okay, all right. So yes, with please. that, I will start off with the first question. Please tell us about your education and work experience that qualifies you for this position. Well, my name is Isabel Muschamp, and you might know me because my last name is on a building in downtown Ventura for the last 15 years. I grew up at a dealership where I bounced around from the finance, sales, service and parts departments. I do have my salesperson's license and I am qualified to sell life and accident insurance in the state of California because I do have my license. I figured if I was able to sell a weapon of destruction like a car, I figured I'd might as well learn to sell the insurance. I also know how to smog a car. I got my smog license and I also have my ASC for service consulting. I also know how to perform services on a vehicle, and I also know how to account for it. I am our accountant for my family's dealership. I also do our taxes. And I've been doing it for the last five years since I've gotten my degree at Ventura College, my alma mater. I got my business degree, um, my Associates of Science and Business Administration from Ventura College. And my, when I was going for my smog license, I didn't realize that Andy Calty would want me to stay in his automotive program and graduate with his degree as well. So I have my second automotive, uh, my second associates of science degree in automotive technology. I also have my smog license, uh, my smog inspector license. And then I started my bachelor of science 
in automotive field service operations at Weber State University out of Utah. I've been working full-time at dealerships in the service departments and sales departments. I'll usually work six days in service, 14-hour days, and then my seventh day, which is Sunday, I'll spend with sales and finance. To me, it's not a job anymore. This is my life. This is my passion. Everything I do, I know that the reputation of my last name stands behind it. My siblings right now, um, my sister is teaching at Santa Barbara City College. She's also teaching automotive. And my brother is in the process of working at Santa Ynez at their auto body and uh, auto shop program. Uh, my father was a master tech growing up and my mother was a stay at home mom who learned the business when my dad opened his shop up 15 years ago. So I know for a fact that even if you don't know the industry, you can learn it firsthand. I've witnessed it. Thank you. All right, Isabel, give us an example of a training objective or student learning outcome that you would expect to address in an introductory automotive course. No one would believe that automotive actually ties into customer service. So bedside manner in the form of the medical, the medical environment, it actually applies to our industry too. A technician shouldn't just learn about how to repair a vehicle or diagnose a vehicle. They also need to know how to communicate with their client and explain on a piece of paper with a pen what happened with the diagnosis. I noticed that at my facility and at other facilities in the business office when I was performing payroll or when I was in the warranty office performing the claims with the vehicle manufacturer that a lot of these technicians are lacking communication skills and not just person to person. It's, it's even, it's, it's even on, you know, paper with a pen. So I feel that these issues need to be addressed and it does need to be considered a learning outcome in an introductory automotive class. Thank you. Okay. Teamwork in the industry is very important. Please provide us with an example of how you handled a disagreement with a coworker and or supervisor. I've had eight years of experience at other facilities in my dealership. And many people that own vehicles or are leasing them, they're under warranty. So you're not just dealing with the dealership that sold them or leased them the vehicle, you're also dealing with the vehicle manufacturer. Some of these customers, especially during these trying economic times, they don't have the resources to fix their vehicles. So as a customer service representative on the ground, I would be held responsible to be the liaison be between the vehicle manufacturer and the service and parts director to, get the, to, to be the advocate for the client to get them the coverage that they deserved because of their loyalty to the facility and to the vehicle manufacturer. If that customer had more than one purchase with that vehicle manufacturer, if that customer was loyal to that facility, I would, I would, I would work for them. So to me, teamwork in the industry, it really is very important because it gets the customer where they need to go when they need to go with what they have. And to me, it all comes down to a dollar, sadly. That's what the industry is. So teamwork is also about compromising and about negotiation. And luckily, we live in the 21st century where I can do it over the phone. <laughs> luckily, because a vehicle manufacturer, it's all 1-800 number on the East Coast. So I'm very grateful for their understanding and their empathy and their bedside manner, even over the telephone. Um, what teaching style 
you use to keep students motivated and engaged in your class? How would you judge a class's engagement in the subject you are teaching? I like to keep the class interactive. I want the parts where we are discussing, the tools we're discussing, the methods, I want them to see it firsthand because personally, I'm a kinesthetic learner. I learn by touching and feeling and witnessing. Most students can learn by reading, they can learn by watching, I learn by doing. And I make it a point no matter who, even even on the job, even if uh, you know, I, even if I'm telling a client an issue about their vehicle, I make sure there's pictures. I make sure I make an appointment so they can come down to see the vehicle and see what the problem is. To me, your eyes and your ears keep you engaged. So for me, I need to see their eyes. I need eye contact. That's how I judge a class's engagement. I need eye contact. I need to hear them. I am one of those people that ask questions. I, I want feedback constantly. And that's how I want them engaged. I don't, I don't see lectures or just flat out labs being enough because it wasn't enough for me. I needed more resources. And luckily my father's facility embraced those needs. Luckily I was able to see my sister and brother build their car. Luckily I was able to work on our books. I was able to experience it firsthand because my parents had enough trust in me. Unfortunately, a lot of students, a lot of, a lot of people don't have those resources, but I wanna make sure that if they don't have them, I will find it for them. So I guess um, the next question is, how would you get the community and industry to su support our automotive program? And how would you remain current in the ever-changing automotive industry? Luckily, I engage in social media. And I have had so many opportunities because of it. Uh, in 2018, I was able to have a full a full ride internship to Lake Havasu to learn about the jet ski racing. And then they even, after the world finals in Havasu in November, they took me to in December to Thailand with their engineering team. I've had so many opportunities with social media. I've been so lucky. Um, not only that, working on the outside from my family's facilities. Um, and just recently I got picked up by an NHRA uh, pro mod race team. And right now, what I want to do is I would, I see a lot of automotive programs embracing racing and they're racing each other at the Baja 500, Baja 1000. They're racing each other at Parker 425. There are so many local races that these colleges are, and they are engaging each other with. It's almost like we have our own separate sports teams now in automotive. And I would, I'd love to embrace that one day and I'd love to encourage it. I'd love to encourage that. Racing is a, uh, what we learn in the school is about money, but to me, racing is about passion. And I feel that I can support our automotive program with racing because we all have that passion. It's not even just about repairing the car anymore. It's about getting it back on the road. Describe your professional experience working with individuals from diverse ethnic, gender, cultural, and socioeconomic backgrounds. Unbelievably, I'm one of them. Half of my family is Muslim. The other half is Seventh-day Adventist. Um, my family is Middle Eastern. The other part's from Jamaica and Guatemala. I feel that the diversity in this industry only makes us stronger. And after as, the, as many facilities as I've been to and I've gotten to work for and the technicians and the different departments that I've met, I actually see more of a camaraderie within our industry than any other. 
Uh, I went into publication for a bit. I went into media for a bit. And from speaking to many of my clients, because I'm in customer service, I speak to many people of different walks of life. We actually might have the most support, even if we're not unionized, which is, which is surprising. Um, you know, you could talk to somebody who's retired from the automotive industry and their, their problems are actually the same problems we're still dealing with. So it's actually amazing to to discuss car vehicles with somebody because they actually catch your drift. They actually know what you're talking about for the most part. There may be a time lapse, but it isn't that great. yourself okay yeah all right isabel number seven recognizing the diversity of the students that enroll in the program from no mechanical experience at all to extensive mechanical experience how would you handle the lab and lecture environments i am very proud to be a female in the automotive industry i never thought my mother would have supported me or even supported my father um, in embracing my sister and I with my brother, my younger brother in our shop. Never would have imagined it, especially with my, with our background. There are a lot of, mm, there are a lot of people that don't have the resources that I have. They will most probably will never have the experiences I've had walking into the classroom. And from for me to accept that it took me walking into a dealership and seeing it firsthand and i know it's my responsibility now to clear that gap because they don't have those resources and i was blessed with them i know it's my responsibility to share my experiences and to share to share everything i have with these students i want them I want them to have the same chances I did as a minority female, especially as a female, especially as a female, it was very difficult. And luckily my father pushed me. Luckily I had a supportive family. While many in our community don't, many of them don't. So for me, it's about understanding. It truly is about understanding. And if they don't understand the first time around, then I know that I have the resources for them to come or I know that they can come to the classroom after hours. I'll have office hours and I can spend one-on-one -on -one time with them. I will make sure they understand because I don't want them leaving my class not knowing. That's the worst. It's not realizing my own potential because I can't see it in them. So I want to make sure that they understand everything, no matter what it takes. I have the time. I have no obligations. I don't have children. I don't have a significant other. I have a bunny. And that's, that's pretty much it. So I have all the time in the world for these kids. I want them to have the same opportunities I did. And still do. Thank you. Okay, number eight. You have a student in your class who is not participating in class. How would you address the situation? I put myself in their shoes. After the amount of time at the dealerships, I have the utmost respect for Bedside Manor and my amount of empathy is great. The first thing I do is put myself in their shoes and I want to give these students a chance i want them to know that they have somebody to come to i was so grateful that my automotive professor was there for me when you mix business and pleasure like you mix a dealership with a family like mine it gets tough and i was so grateful that my automotive professor andy calty was there for me always there for me no matter what happened no matter what was going on i had him I had no one else. So for me, I hope these students understand that they can always come to me because 
Even if I haven't seen it all, I know someone that has. And I know that times are tough. I know things are only going to get worse. But I know that there's hope. And I'm always going to have a candle. I'm always going to be there to have a light for them. Because I know what it's like to have nothing but darkness. I know. Because nobody knows what it's like to be a business owner. Nobody understands that. And balancing school on top of it, nobody will ever get it. But these students should know that they have somebody who knows, who understands. Because I do. I've lived through it. I've lived through it. So these students, they're not coming to an amateur at all. They're coming to an automotive professional who not just understands the mechanical aspects, but I do understand how it affects your personal life. Okay, thank you. in class a student asks you to perform work on his car how would you respond to the student's request i'm coming from the business aspect of the industry um, not just the mechanical aspect so i do like to protect myself legally as well as the facility i'm working at or even the college for that matter <laughs> um, so i do like a paper trail I do like it approved by a lawyer. I do like it going through the hierarchy. Um, if a cuss, if a if a uh, student wants to work on their vehicle, obviously they're going to assume all liability if they're the ones that are working on it, because technically there won't be any professionals other than me, and I won't have the amount of time to focus on them when I have other students in the class. Uh, so they would have the option of bringing it into the class and taking on full liability, um, and, or they could come in during office hours. I'd be more than happy to help. Obviously, they'd still assume full liability, but I would be there to at least assist. I do like the buddy system. I do not believe that any technician in a shop should be working alone. There has to be at least two people. One, if they're hurt. Two, to call 911 when the other person's hurt. So I do... Uh, I do encourage the buddy system. So there has to be at least two people working on that car. So the other, the second person should at least sign off as well on that legal document. I would start an advisory board. We need input from the industry. Real data, current data from the industry. There is a there is a gap from when you leave college to when you actually get to a facility. There's a very large gap. And I feel that it mostly has to do with the time, the timing. I want there to be additional resources for these students who understand the full, the full concept of the industry that it isn't just about the mechanical aspects. Even though they are a technician, they will have to learn how to communicate. They will have to learn how to spell correctly. They will have to learn how to write some dealerships are using digital electronic methods while others are still on old school paper and pen, completely manual, where a warranty administrator has to read your writing and if they can't read what you wrote on your story, you don't get paid. So it ends up costing you. And the last thing I want is a student telling me that I didn't teach them what they needed to succeed at a facility. So I want to close that gap. I want to use the knowledge that I have from the industry and I want to apply it. And the only way for me to apply it is to get people actually from the industry and bring them in to the school and have my students listen firsthand and have our 
instructors listen firsthand on what we need to work on and what curriculum isn't isn't closing that gap so we can help our students because the last thing they need is a sink or swim thought a moment at the facility when they first get hired and they don't know what's happening a type a personality and that's probably why I was able to bounce from each department at the dealership because of that I have time management skills I have to organize because I want to make sure the next person that comes into the office knows what's happening where I left off I also have a great deal of patience so let's say nobody's doing their job right or something's going wrong. I'm going to be there no matter what. And I'm going to see it through. So for me, I can pick up the slack. Whoever can't get it done, I will get it done. Because I have the resources and I have the mindset. I've already operated a facility. The school doesn't scare me. share I'm gonna do you mind if I scream there uh, I don't quite know what that means but go ahead try it let's see what happens um I just want to show you the I want to show you the presentation on yes. the on my on my iPhone um, it says you cannot start screen share while the other participant is sharing okay I will stop sharing there you go thank you very much Success? Ooh. Success. Success. Excellent. See it. <laughs> Excellent. Hello, everyone. We're going to be discussing measuring with a micrometer and a veneer. So the micrometer is the most important tool in the machine shop. 
It's a precision measurement tool used to measure variations in size too small for the naked eye to see. This is literally life or death. When I'm in my 1969 Chevelle, this is gonna save my life. I need to make sure everything in this vehicle is exact. This is a science. We are now scientists. We are dealing with one one thousandth of an inch. So the different types of micrometers that are used to measure inside widths and diameters, outside lengths and thicknesses, depths of holes or cuts, but the principle used by each is the same. I do want to show how these tools are used inside of the machine shop because the machine shop, especially when you're on a race team, it becomes your hangout and you want to know what's going to save your life. So I've actually stayed at the machine shop and gotten to hang out, see what's inside of the engine, inside of my engine. Oop, there we go. All right. Not only that, we have accessories for these tools to measure other components inside of the engine, such as a telescoping gauge. You can actually attach it to the micrometer. It can measure other components within the engine. Okay, other pictures, okay. Our engine compartment and that telescoping gauge. Okay, we're inside one of the cylinders inside the engine block. All right. So I do wanna discuss the characteristics of a micrometer. Okay, the thimble is a part of the spindle assembly that contains a scale. Everything is graduated on that spindle assembly to represent one one thousandth of an inch. This micrometer, it uses the principle of the screw to control the movement of the spindle. I don't know if you can see on that right side up at the top above the thimble. That is that screw that we are going to rotate to move the spindle into the anvil to measure whatever component we need. That screw has 40 threads to the inch. So technically speaking, 40 turns of that spindle move it an entire inch. Okay, so 1 40th of an inch, okay, is 25th of 1,000th, okay? This is very important because every time you turn that screw, it's meaningful. And this this that distance is the distance between life or death we are literally dealing with one one thousandths of an inch now i'm a visual learner like i said so i need to see everything broken down i actually wanted to see the threads on this screw divided so i could understand the math because the math is actually easier to explain in dollars Everything comes down to a dollar amount, especially when it comes to life or death, especially when it comes to thousands of an inch and car parts for a race car. We're talking about hundreds and thousands of dollars. Hopefully you have a sponsor. Each portion of this micrometer has a scale. So each movement of travel is meaningful. Okay. Now, I do want to explain the money portion because it actually gets easier to understand. I know one one thousandth of an inch is very difficult to understand, but we all get money. So what ends up taking place is when we are talking about money, we're actually just going to move the decimal point to the left. Remember Beyonce song to the left, to the left. That's how I remember it. Beyonce to the left, to the left, Queen Bay. So what ends up happening is we have a ten dollar bill. That means one inch. Okay, the $1 bill is actually one thousandth of an inch because we're moving that decimal point over. Okay, so when we start looking at a micrometer, we start to see that we can actually split this up even further from $10 bills to $1 bills to quarters to pennies. Because who uses dimes and nickels anymore, right? So what ends up taking place is our micrometers have specific sizes. And luckily, they're written on the micrometer. And what ends up taking place is, depending on what part you're measuring, you can see, luckily this one, I don't know if you can, I'm so sorry, I don't know if you can see it, it says two to three inches. So you have to make sure that that part is at least two inches or you're never gonna get a measurement. You might have to go smaller. 
You might have to go to zero to one inches. You might have to go bigger. It all depends on what part you're measuring to get an exact measurement. You have to make sure you're using common sense and logic or you're never going to get a reading. It's got to make sense, right? So once again, we're talking about the money. Okay, so the dollars on the micrometer. Okay, we're looking at the barrel for the dollars. You can see zero, one, two. Okay, now the decimal point is moved to the left, to the left. Okay, so that means that they're right there. We're looking we're already looking at two dollars, right? And then at the bottom, you're seeing the veneer scale. It's broken up. It's breaking up that scale on the barrel from dollars to quarters. Okay, now I do want to mention that on the right, on the complete right, that vertical scale, we have to remember that's called the thimble. And that is on the spindle, right? Thimble is vertical, spindle is horizontal, okay? Now we're moving on to the quarters, okay? Now the scale at the top, remember it's dollars, okay? Remember the top of the barrel, okay, it's dollars. At the bottom, you can see it's broken up into four sections, and those are our quarters. Remember, we move the decimal point to the left, to the left. That's why it's 0 0.025 or 25 thousandths. Okay, and then remember the scale that goes vertical, that's the thimble, okay? And it's on the spindle. Make sure you guys get that. Then, of course, the pennies. You guys remember when there was a rumor that they were going to discontinue the pennies? <laughs> we're going to pay homage. So now we're actually not looking at the barrel, okay? That horizontal scale now we're looking at that vertical scale okay remember that is the thimble and it's on the spindle okay now it's actually divided into 25 okay so those are pennies okay remember to the left to the left okay we're moving that decimal point to the left so it's actually one one thousandths okay each marking on that thimble okay the thimble is that vertical scale remember is one one thousandths of an inch okay here's another diagram just in case you need to see it a uh, different perspective okay you can see the thimble that's circular on the spindle and you see the 25 divisions and remember it's one one thousandth because we move that one cent that decimal point to the left once again remember dollars quarters pennies because who uses dimes and nickels anymore so now we're going to try one we're going to look at the barrel which is the vertical scale we're going to see the number four okay so it's four tenths right we're going to move that decimal point to the left to the left right so that's actually the four dollars right okay and then we're going to see the pennies on the ver on the uh, vertical scale, not the horizontal scale, the vertical scale, which is the thimble. And we're going to see where that line meets the barrel. So we know it's 24 thousandths. So you can see the math on the right side. We're literally going to add this up to get the measurement of the part that is in between the um, in, in between is right in between the anvil okay all right and here's another one we're seeing the dollars on the barrel which is the vertical scale okay i'm seeing five dollars remember to the left to the left we're moving that decimal point to the left then we're going to look at that veneer scale at the bottom to see the quarters. You see right after the five, how it splits up, right? I see three quarters, which is 75 cents. We're going to move that decimal point to the left, to the left. Okay. And then we're going to read the thimble, which is on the spindle, right? That's that horizontal. Um, that's that, I'm sorry, that vertical. It's that vertical scale. 
Okay, we're gonna count the pennies. I see seven, that's where the line on that thimble meets the barrel. We're gonna add the dollars, we're gonna add the quarters, and we're gonna add the pennies. And that's our measurement in inches. And then I definitely want you guys to have a chance to practice this. And I wanna say thank you very much for spending time with me and enduring my, instruc uh, my instruction on micrometers and, veneer and the veneer. Thank you guys. Move this around, Let's zoom, all right. Uh, thank you, Isabel, for the demonstration. Uh, is there anything that you would like to add that we have not already covered? Um, I want to say thank you for the opportunity to interview me, especially during these trying times. Literally everything is standing in the way, and you guys have made it possible for me to interview with your amazing facility, and I want to thank you for that. And thank you for being essential, too. questions of the committee at this point no okay all right with that i'm going to go ahead and uh let you know that our next step in the process is that obviously we're going to collaborate and then determine who the finalists will be and at that time reference checks will be conducted um and then when the final decision is made and a candidate selected for the position will be contacted and employment would be offered at that point. Okay? Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity.